And I'll be talking more about the cartridge belt later. Bandelier. Bandelier. A bandelier, yeah. The, 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 with the cartridges in it. Yep, thank you, whoever said that. This is the M1. Now, there are a lot of military um, instruments, or, or um, accoutrements, and so forth. They're known as M1, which means the first model. But in the infantry, if you said M1, it meant only one thing. It meant the M1 Grand Rifle. Now, the Grand Rifle, Patton said, was the best damn implement for war that was ever invented. Well, he probably said the same thing about a tank, and, and Ike said the same thing about the Higgins boat, and somebody else said it about a Jeep. But anyway, it's a pretty good endorsement of our M1 Garand. It was selected in 1936. Bob, uh, yeah. back off just a little. Yeah. Sure. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. It was selected in 1936 in competition with several other companies, of course, that wanted the military to have their, their rifle. And the Grand was the one that was selected. Uh, it's a 30 caliber rifle. Uh, it is semi-automatic, which means that you pull the trigger, and each time you pull the trigger, a shell comes out. Now, we first trained when we were in, well, when those of us who were in Benning, before we were the 87th in Jackson, we trained with the Enfield and the Springfield. Now, those were World War I rifles, and those were bold action, which means you want to fire, you do this, and then this, then you pull, you do this, and then this, and pull. But this is called end block clip, and Here's your M block clip with eight rounds in it, and that inserts vertically in here. This is a display of various accoutrements, if you would, that you can add to it. Here, of course, is the bayonet, the bayonet sheet. This is a grenade launcher. This is very similar to a hand grenade. Uh, here, of course, is your M block clip. Here's a cartridge or a bandolier belt for carrying them. Um, this shows how it will break down. And that was intentionally designed that way so that in field service you could take it apart and clean it. Also, for some purposes, maybe it's easier to store and get someplace. I don't know. But in training, uh, one of the first things we learned about an M1 was how to take it apart, put it together, and you got so you could do a blindfold it. And I forgot how long it took, a couple of minutes, but uh, everybody is able to take that apart, put it back together as an effective weapon in just a, a few minutes. The M1 weighs about 10 pounds, depending a little bit on the slang, leather, canvas, and what might be out here. It weighs about 10 pounds, and it has an effective range of uh, 400 to 500 yards. By effective, well, that's hard for me to define, but I guess you're saying that it will hold its accuracy for that length, and it would be uh, a significant um, problem if you got in the way of the bullet. This is a um, picture that has become, I'm going to say, quite famous. Um, it's in our, um, our 87th history volume, and it's been in at least two or three other national um, um, World War II volumes that I've seen. And it's, it is a, whoops, here again. Uh, too many levers. <laughs> too many levers. Uh, over here is Tom Hewlett's father. Is Tom here? Yes. What was his name? He was also Tom. Tom Hewlett. He was also Tom. Okay. Do you happen to know any of the others here? Well, the man in front that's bending down getting shot was John Olson, a former national 
association commander. No, uh, I'm sorry. Right, next, next one. Yeah, that's John Olson. Yeah, that's John Olson. Uh, John just passed away uh, a few months ago. And, uh, we know the names of some of the others. Uh, I can't name them all for you right now, and some of them are unknown. I think this is Dick Pierce. And Dick was at the reunion here a few years ago, and our careers are very parallel. Uh, we went through Cornell together, and uh, I never knew until about 10 years ago that he was an 87. This, of course, I'm going to say of course, I'm going to say it, it looks like it was taken during the Battle of the Bulge, although it wasn't the only time it snowed. Um, here, you see the carbine. You can tell by the extended clip there. This looks like, with those two little legs, like it would be an M1. I think it's a BAR. A B a, what am I saying? A BAR, yes, with those two little legs. And someplace here, I thought I could see a canteen. That looks like another mess kit. Um, hard to tell what that is back there. That could be a BAR there, too. All right. So, um, this is the M1 mortar, which uh, is the 60 millimeter smooth bore mortar. It weighs 42 pounds, and it's really comes in. Here's where I want to be. It comes in two pieces. The barrel, or the tube, and the bipod fold together, and the strap wraps around them, you carry it over your shoulder. The base plate goes in a bag, a canvas bag, and you carry that over your shoulder. Together, they weigh 42 pounds. Now, they said it's smooth bore, which means there's no rifling, much different than artillery and certainly your, your rifles. And the, um, it's considered to be the infantryman's artillery because you can take it any place you can carry it. And it uh, only takes, I'm going to say, a couple of minutes to set it up. Uh, I, was a, I was a mortarman that, that set them up. Uh, it's a high trajectory uh, weapon. You can see that too, if your shell goes up, it's going to go like that, kind of like Tiger Woods sitting in a golf shot. Except for this, you probably went straight instead of crooked. Um, it will change in elevation. That, that's probably pretty close to its top elevation. I think it'll go to 80 or 85 degrees up and more 45 degrees down. And the, the further down it is, of course, the greater distance you might get out of it. The um, range of this is 400 to 1,000 yards. Um, the shells, let me go to the next one. The shells, uh, I don't know, I'm going to say it's about 8 inches long, maybe it's 10. You see there are four fins down here, and inside, between the fins, is a little powder charge. Here's the legs that go into the ground and the base plate to keep it stable and you can uh, these um, there it is I guess and here on this you you adjust it so that it's level and you adjust it so that you get the trajectory you want whether you want it this way or that way now to control the distance uh, the range here is, is uh, 400 to 1,000 yards, more or less. And of course, if you're going 1,000 yards, you're going to put it down like this. You're going to leave all four charges in there. If you're going to go only 200 yards, you're going to be more up like this. And you're going to use maybe only one or two of the charges in here. When this goes, it exposes an impact. So there's no time fuse in it. That's an impact there. Uh, that one's probably a smoke grenade, I don't know, but you can also uh, use it for, for smoke. Um, so you can see the size of this, which is 81 millimeters. 
I'm going to describe as probably a little bit smaller than a, a tennis ball. Hand grenade. Everybody knows what a hand grenade is. You pick it up and you throw it, it goes bang. But that's not quite the story. Neither is it the story like you saw in some early World War II movies where they throw it in a tank and the tank would explode. Well, what, 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 a, what a laugh that was. But here's a hand grenade, they call it the pineapple. And this is an M1, it's an M2, incidentally. Um, it's very similar. I'm working on it. There's what I want to be. It's very similar to a firecracker. Firecracker has a paper wrapping. It has powder inside, and it has a fuse. Well, this is the same, except it's made out of, I don't know, it's cast iron or steel. But you see how it's serrated. When it explodes, these serrations break off, and you have flying shrapnel. In order to throw it, and here again, what do they say a good range is? Uh, 30 to 35 yards. Uh, you don't try to see how far you can throw it. You, you, don't, you don't throw it like a baseball. You throw it with your whole arm like, like that because it's, it's, it's awful tough on the elbow to try to throw it like a baseball. And this is the safety loop. And here is the firing mechanism. When you pull the safety loop out, this, this crank goes up and it arms it and you throw it and the detonation time is three to four seconds uh, before it will explode. So uh, when you throw it, you want to make sure maybe that you're down, particularly if you're going less than 30 yards with it. And I have kind of a, uh, I'm going to call it a cute story to tell about the hand grenade. It's when we were in training. And so often, you know, you'd be out there, 30 guys, whatever it was, sitting on the ground under some pine trees, getting some kind of a lecture information, being taught about something. And this, uh, this, this trainer, probably a sergeant, he had the hand grenade in his hand. And he was explaining, much as I've been trying to explain to you, about using it. And he said, you know, here it is. He says, you can even pull that pin out, and there's nothing wrong with it. Then you put the pin back, and then you tuck it back in. He says, so I, you take the pin out, and just don't let it loose like that. So you should have seen those 30 guys scramble. <laughs> of course, he was giving us a lesson. It was a dud, but uh, he just trying to prove to us how important it was to know when to pull and when not to pull that. So thanks for uh, listening to me here. Let's let's just see, let's see if we can go to the next one. There it is. Uh, we're going to have discussion questions after each presentation. Do you have anything? While well, I'm still up here. Okay. Then uh, here comes Barney's Moda, and he's going to do the next section. Barney, this is this is right. Don't be persuading. But this is forward, that's back, and that's your pointer. Forward, back, forward, pointer. Okay. Good luck. That's all. You would put on the side this way. I don't want to be too, I don't want to be too, too close to it. Say when it's okay. That's all. Good. All right. All right. Uh, I probably have to thank our, our uh, regimental commander for uh, letting me be here because uh, uh, some of them know uh, what what happened with uh, with the galoshes we were given and the galoshes we had to throw away. Okay, so anyway, uh, it turns out I got a few thanks to give, uh, even even if if he did uh, abandon us after two weeks. Uh, Jack Higgins and I were gunners on, on the light machine gun. Uh, this, this was uh, the, the, it's, an a, it's an A4 on the tripod. The gun itself weighs about 31 pounds and the tripod weighs about 10 pounds. In, in traveling, 
one man would carry the tripod, one would carry the gun, and of course, you know, the gun is a little more <laughs> to bear with. And uh, to put it into action, you know, the, the guy with the tripod would flop down, and the next guy would come with the gun and set it in. And the animal bearer, we had, or I will, let me back up a little bit, uh, like the mortar squads, uh, there were two gunners, two ammo bearers, and anyone else, we had a, a squad leader and sometime an assistant squad leader, and uh, we had two machine gun squads to the section. But uh, uh, setting it up like that uh, was, was one advantage using the tripod. Uh, There is a, a little bar across the legs there and a clamp, and this can be tightened or loosened. And also, uh, the barrel of the gun or the gun could be aimed by lifting it up with a screw mechanism, and, uh, and so the gun can be, uh, where is it, raised or lowered, and it could also be swiveled side to side if, if you loosen the clamp on the bar over here. Now, this was this was the, the weapon that we trained with in, in uh, all our time in, in camp. Just before just before we went over, they were they issued a new piece. Let's see now. Uh, it doesn't show the uh, the new new gun. What? What was the difference? It came to be a one-man piece. There was no longer a tripod. It had fixed legs, a bipod here that could be adjustable for height, and it did swivel around. And instead of just the gun stock here, it had a shoulder piece like like the stock on a on a uh, rifle. Well, uh, again, I, I'm going to give thanks to my ex-colonel that we we never really got that much practice with either piece in in the, in the service. There, uh, I might add though that the new machine gun with the bipod and no tripod weighed about three pounds more than this gun itself. So in order to be like a 34 pound piece, to, to, you, you're the one who loved it. <laughs> and you had it all and, and were fed by the ammo bearers. Well, this again, this in practice was probably a more efficient weapon because it was mobile as far as direction of fire. Uh, we don't have we don't have slides of the A6, I guess. Uh, I don't. That's the A4. Uh, no, that's that's the BAR. Uh, but let me uh, let me use this as an example. If this had the regular box of ammunition feeding in uh, feeding in here. And you, you have this thing, say, let's say you're in your foxhole or whatever. Now, again, this, you can see they can swivel that piece, whatever the target happens to be, to you. But if you have something like this, and you're down in a foxhole, and 34 pounds of gun is out there in front of you, how do you lift up that doggone thing to be in? Well, uh, I don't know how long that A6 model stayed in, in, in action because I happened to catch a documentary, I guess it was a Korean War documentary, and a flash showed, showed that the A4 on the tripod with a shoulder stock. So, Whatever they did, maybe they, they found out later on that, that uh, just using a bipod on a, on a weapon that's so heavy uh, it wasn't that practical. 
So, uh, uh, what, whatever they whatever they did later on. In fact, uh, if anybody has seen the uh, Korean War Memorial in Washington, with those fellows walking away, trying to get away from it all. There was a machine gun squad there. It was an A4, the old machine gun squad. One's carrying the, the gun itself, and one's carrying the tripod. So I don't know what, what the story was uh, about the change from the A4 tripod gun to the A6 bipod one. Uh, maybe I'm fortunate enough that I that I didn't find out. Uh, actually, in a, in a, either either gun uh, had a a box of, of a, maybe you've seen the box of a ammunition for a machine gun. Uh, it carried something like uh, what two uh, two hundred fifty rounds in, in that box, and it was supposedly fires four hundred to five hundred. Uh, uh, rounds per minute with, with so-called range of 1,500 yards, no, three par, uh, three par fives. Uh, there was a story on the internet, um, I don't know if it was on Wikipedia or wherever someplace, that this gun would take too long to put into action, let's say, when necessary or out of action because you had to separate the, uh, the gun itself from the tripod and things like that. Well, again, I think there's a little more mobility doing something like that than, again, speaking of that 34-pound job that had to get the belt out and so on. That's, uh, maybe that's uh, probably all right. Well, now we've got what they call the Browning automatic rifle. Uh, there was a number of uh, models of this weapon, and uh, at one place, one time they said uh, you can determine, the gunner can determine himself whether he wants to use it as a machine gun or semi-automatic by firing each time the trigger was pulled. Well, and then they said something about with a 20-round with a magazine on the there, and if you use it as a machine gun, you'd be out of ammunition pretty fast, like a machine gun with 250 rounds to a, to a belt. Uh, I never fired this weapon itself, but back in Fort Jackson, when, when, on about a 25-mile hike, because I, I was a machine gunner and I didn't have to carry the machine gun, I was just armed with a, with a pistol, they gave me the job to spell the Browning Man <laughs> to carry that thing. Now, I think, what was that weight on that thing? Uh, 19, 19 pounds. <laughs> where what your M1 is, what, 10 pounds or something like that. Well, uh, so I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't envy the guy having to, to, to be armed with that. I don't know how many BARs we had in a rifle company. Uh, I tried one, to per, one per rifle platoon. One per I mean, one per squad. squad. One per, per squad. squad. OK, because I, I uh, got Wikipedia on the internet, and I even got the Army Museum in Carlisle trying to get the, uh, the organization of an infantry company, but not much, not much was available. But anyway, uh, that, that uh, fired a 30 caliber uh, round, just like the machine gun did. And, uh, well, let's see, as far as uh, 20 rounds fires, Again, it said it fired 300 to 400 rounds, uh, you know, rounds per minute. But uh, I don't know what the, what the effective range was, but I imagine it's probably uh, similar to the M1 uh, rifle. Let's see what where we go now. 
show both of those weapons there. Am I going the right way? Yeah. Oh, oh I want to go back just one minute. <laughs> uh, I don't know how many people can remember Bob Burns. He was a kind of a stand-up hillbilly comedian. Any, anybody remember Bob Burns? It goes back to maybe the late 30s or something like that. Well, something like a Spike Jones man, he, he designed his own instrument. Uh, he played it without a mouthpiece. It was a, a tool and, and had some fixtures on it. Uh, anybody can come up and see this later on. That's Bob Burns and his bazooka. Well, because it had that long tube, and here we come up with a, with a weapon, just a long tube open at both ends. I don't know who named it, but it was very well named. Uh, okay, now this, this piece, uh, again, I don't know how many were assigned to an infantry company either. Uh, I did have an opportunity to fire that thing. Now, what? Uh, let's see if we got. Okay, there are. There is a. There's there's a projector. It, it, it's something like a rocket. And it's about the same size, really, as the 60 millimeter mortar shell. Much, much the same. And, it, and it's, and it's uh, propelled in a similar manner. Uh, the the projector is more or less like a two-man operation. You have one man holding this thing, aiming it, as the trigger there. Uh, the, weapon, the, the projectile is inserted into the back, connected electrically, and the when the, the, the loader is ready, he would tap the gunner, well this is theory, would tap the gunner on the shoulder and clear. You pull that trigger and there's an explosion. But you don't feel anything, really, in a way. It's, it's not like a rifle with a kick or, or artillery piece that, or a mortar that jumps, because there is no no baffle or nothing in the back, it's just an open tube and, and the projectile ex explodes in firing like, like the mortar shell. It, by the time it leaves the front end, the, the, the charge, the, the, the delivery charge is, is expended already and, and it's on its way. Now these, these things are, uh, you know, again, uh, I can't can't vouch for the uh, accuracy of them or uh, efficacy, but uh, there was one one change one change made. Again, I got this from the, the internet, uh, where this had a pointy nose. Now, in the the the, uh, the effectiveness, this was an anti tank uh, anti tank weapon. And in, in the nose of that thing was the explosive charge, but it was molded. It was not powder or anything, it was molded. And uh, something like if you took an ice cream cone, the cone itself, and pushed it into the charge, into the mold, it would be a hollow cone-shaped uh, appearance to that charge. So when, when, when they made an impact and the, the mechanism to explode that charge, it would concentrate the charge to like a small point and this is what, what permitted that, that, little weapon, that little weapon there to penetrate steel on tanks and so on and so on. Uh, again, uh, maybe there's somebody here who has far more experience on, on the, the delivery of a weapon like that. Now the other, there were one other thing they said that uh, because this had a, 
pointy nose, I guess just like any rocket should be pointed. If it happened to hit a part of a tank that was sloped, the thing could ricochet just like a rifle bullet or a rock or anything else. So they redesigned, uh, they redesigned that uh, projectile with a blunt nose and it, it again supposedly made it uh, more effective by, on, on, uh, by, uh, to explode by whatever angle it's meeting its target. And of course it was still, uh, it still had the same shape charge in it uh, as the original one. Now you probably have heard on the new, current newsreels in Afghanistan and Pakistan about these, uh, well, whatever, you know, these people that were supposedly fighting, they all are all firing these uh, grenade launchers. Grenade launchers, that's what it is. It's, it, it's, a, it's a form of bazooka. And by us, you know, they're pretty, they're pretty good weapons. Uh, well, I, I guess, that's probably uh, all I've got to say. I've got some pictures over here uh, of, of uh, these different weapons, and uh, although, although the slides over here show it pretty well, I don't know if there's anything okay. Uh, there's, there's your picture, and it's, it's a rudimentary aiming. up to a range of about 300 yards. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know, maybe, maybe the one who was, who was really aiming that thing deliberately uh, would like to wait, would wait a little closer, longer to get a shorter range and make sure that uh, once he let it fire the darn thing and exposed himself that uh, the thing did its, its uh, job <laughs> at the other end.
Thanks a lot, Bob. My name is John McCall. I was in the heavy weapons, and my uh, weapon was the 81 millimeter mortar. Now, the mortars I use to support infantry, they can also be used for destroying buildings and uh, things like that. Centuries ago, the mortar, the mortar was in use, only it was like a, a stubby cannon, maybe that long, and the walls were about four or five inches thick, and they had these huge cannonballs that set in it, and you put the torch, the wick to the thing, and out it went, and it would smash everything. But they did away with those centuries later, and they came into vogue again during World War I, during the trench warfare because they could easily lob these mortars into open trenches and kill the enemy. Now those were known as the Stokes mortar, but they were perfected those, uh, but that came about was the Brandt mortar. I think the French invented it. And this mortar here was uh, superimposed and perfected on that. Uh, the mortar and heavy machine gun are the heavy weapons in a company. In a company, in a battalion, you have three rifle companies and one heavy weapons company. You might have a mortar platoon with three mortars and uh, a squad. This, a section is composed of two squads. And you might have three sections in a mortar platoon. Now, the machine gun is somewhat similar. Barney might say. Now here you have the 81 millimeter mortar. Uh, Bob told us about it. I'd just like to uh, go on with what he said about it with a little more. It's consisting of the, it's a, a muzzle loading, smooth bore, it's not rifled, weapon. <coughs> and uh, you have the tube, and at the base of the tube there's a knob and it locks into the base plate. You put it in and you twist it and lock it. The base plate, as you see, is on the bottom is ribbed. There are three ribs which uh, is anchored into the ground because when you get a uh, repercussion, every round sinks that mortar back deeper and deeper into the ground. And if you're in a muddy area, that thing's gonna go way down and the tube is gonna be going way up in the air. So usually in soft ground, or in soft ground, we would get some uh, logs or balls and put it underneath the base plate. Now you see the bipod is the main mechanism. You can see the prongs on the base where it's anchored into the ground. Now the tube is strapped onto the bipod. You lay the tube in there, you throw the strap over it and tighten it. And that keeps the tube secure to the bipod. On the left side, on your right, you see that instrument, that's called the clinometer. That's like a, a compass almost. You insert that in a slot on the bipod. And there are two bubbles in there. And you can, the, the gunner watches that, he's, he's, eyeing, he's got his eye on that bubble, and he has his right hand his left hand on the left leg where there is a spiral and that can keep the bipod this way and the right hand is on that other now I'm all confused uh, that little wheel on the right turns so he's uh, He's got his eye on, in the chronometer to make sure the bubbles are level. Because every round that goes in, it throws the whole thing off. You want to keep it level. Um, so you have the gunner and the loader. The loader stands on the right, and he drops the round in. The other men are uh, ammunition bearers, which I was. And every mortar round is encased in a cardboard carton. And it's really taped. Uh, they, they went to great expense to make sure that these bombs 
always worked. Now the Germans kept their mortar rounds in wicker baskets. They were open to the elements. They got wet, they got frozen, they were rusted, and they were, many times they did not work. So we had that advantage. And it was the job of the, uh, the, the uh, people who carried the, the bombs, like I was, three, <clears throat> three or four of us, we would take the tape off and hand the bomb to the loader, and he would drop it in. Uh, we don't have a picture of the, uh, they call it a bomb. There are three types of bombs. HE light weighed about 6.7 pounds. That was the one we used against the enemy, against troops. You had a longer one, about a foot long. It was uh, white phosphorus. Now, white phosphorus is very uh, damaging, and that may have been used against uh, fortifications or tanks or something of that nature. Thank you. You also had a smoke bomb about that long, and that could be used if you want to disguise troops or hide people from the enemy. But we didn't use those too much. Most of the bombs we used were the HE light. And uh, the HE light bomb is about that long, and on the end, as Bob said, there were fins, six fins. And in between the fins, there were explosive powder called increments. And you had a chart telling you how far each shell would go according to the number of increments left on. If you wanted to shoot it far, you left all six on there. If you wanted to shoot lesser distance, you took one or two or three off, off the shell. Now, um, they, usually when you're in a, a stable position, if you weren't firing too much, the uh, lieutenant would come down with his map, and he knew the targets, and he knew the azimuth on the target, and he would give that to the first, to the, uh, to the sergeant, the, uh, the charge of the section. And then, of course, he would uh, determine uh, where we were shooting at that azimuth. It could have been a barn, it could have been a group of troops, it could have been anything you wanted it to be. So out in front of the weapon, as you go in, this, in the, uh, in the hospitality room, I have some pictures in there, and it shows some of the troops in the mortar hole. Now, on two of those pictures are actual combat positions, and I'm in the hole with my buddy Danny Marini. And uh, I'm also in a, another hole showing the, uh, me with the mortar. Now, it's usually used to uh, fight against, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, support your rifle companies. And we would be positioned perhaps uh, 100, 200, quarter of a mile behind the action up front. So we were always not in view of the enemy, which was a good thing. So we could walk around, we might set the gun up in the back of a barn, a building, or a hill, a slope, unseen to the enemy. So we'd always had our position marked. Now we'd come up on a scene, and uh, you tuck in the mortar. Every mortar had to have a hole that deep, that big, big as this chest. And during the balls, it was very high ground, it took a long time to dig that hole, a couple of hours. Then you had to dig your own hole. Then time to, the order would come down, okay, we're moving out to swear at that lieutenant and everybody else. <laughs> I think we dug more holes over Europe than we did firing the mortar. Now each mortar hole had a, a spool of wire, very small wire. There must, I never, I thought, oftentimes I thought, how much wire is laid over all of Europe. You had regimental wire, battalion, company, 
put two, and as you go down, the wire gets smaller and smaller and smaller in diameter because the distance is shorter. So you had a telephone at your pit, which called into the CP, in this case your company CP, and the company would be have charge of maybe six mortars. They'd be in different places you might expect, because the mortar platoon, in my case M Company, had to support K, L, and M companies. Those were the rifle companies. We each had a company to support. Now during the bulge, the action was very close, and as you can see by the mortar, it was strapped on, and uh, you could elevate it just so high. It's not going to go any higher. And you could traverse it just so far. So, the further the enemy away is, you would use the six increments, and you had it at a nice angle, and you could reach them maybe 4,000 yards. The closer the enemy, the more upright the mortar. Now, if the enemy were in 50 yards, you're not going to reach them because it's going to go over their heads. So what these fellas did, they unbuckled the tube and held it up straight, took all the instruments off so it would come down quicker. They blessed themselves and hope it didn't come down on top of them. Yeah. So that's what they did, and I have a picture out there on M Company, on the, it was taken in St. Joubert, called the Rue de Monde. I think you all, that's the other famous picture, the one, other one was what Bob showed you, I Company, with John Olson and uh, Frank's brother, the father. Uh, this other picture is my company, right in the forefront, they're in a jeep. And I know all those men in the forefront. The two fellows over in the left corner are Corporal Norman Portal and uh, the fellow from South Carolina. They got the Bronze Star because of that action. They stayed with the mortar, unbuckled it, and fired it. Now, uh, we had another mortar section uh, sergeant, Sousa. He was a very funny guy. He was about five feet four. And during the winter months, the troops grew these handlebar mustaches. I think George remembers. I don't know if he had one. And Susan had one. He was so short and big mustache. And the fellow in his uh, company was uh, Carpenter, Francis Carpenter. And the last thing, he, Susan always told these wonderful stories. And the last thing he saw after they dropped the motor and ran is Carpenter, six feet two, he had 16 size shoes, his coat flaps flapping in the wind, he's taken off over the hill and dropped the motor and they just took off. So those are some of the things, uh, experiences we had. But uh, I weighed about 150 pounds. I had two OD pants on, two OD shirts, a wool sweater, a field jacket, and the overcoat. And I had my pack, the canteen, and I had to carry the ammunition. There were six rounds in a pouch. So that was about 42 pounds of ammunition. And you couldn't throw it over your head because the pack was in back of you. So you just picked it up, slung it over one shoulder. And you had your galoshes and you had to walk, I don't know how far, a quarter of a mile, a mile, with all that weight to a foot of snow. And it was really exhausting, to say the least, besides being frozen cold. So one of the uh, places where we were, we come up out of Luxembourg, back into Belgium. We were up near Mandefeld. That, that was about five miles from the German border. And we were heading into that. But the Ardennes, as you remember, were clumps of woods, acres, and an open field, expanse, and another acre. So we come up to this edge of the forest, and there was a lieutenant there, 
and he was setting the men out across this wide expanse. Okay, you go, we wait 25 yards. Okay, the next one, you go. And I come up to him, and I got six rounds on my back, and all my other equipment. He looks at me and says, Sonny, that's too much. I said, what can I do? Okay, go ahead. So I'm walking out 50 yards in the snow, and the shells started to come in. I just fell flat down on my face. I didn't care what happened. I just felt exhausted from carrying I was just hoping a fragment wouldn't hit the mortars on their back. That's the way you think, you know. Pretty soon, Kelly's shaking me. Come on, Matt, get moving, move it. So we moved on up into the other clump of woods. Well, we got in there and more shells started coming down, three bursts. And another kid and I hit under a, a, a tree. It was a fallen tree. But the guy next to me didn't get under. And we come out, he had his knee blown open. One of those fragments caught him in the knee. So we were calling for medics. So I looked around and I said, where is everybody? I couldn't see anybody around. And some kid yells out there, down in the bunker. I said, what bunker? I don't see any bunkers. Sure enough, I went around the back, and there's a stairway going down to a German bunker. It was not a, what, a bunker for firing. It was a sleeping bunker that had cots in it, maybe 12 cots in the stove. So that's where we stayed that night, in that bunker. What a relief. You could take off your shoes and your boots. I hadn't had them off in a few weeks. But when the morning came, it was still cold. We didn't have any stove down there. So when the morning came, uh, Kelly put me on a detail. And it was taking me you know, half an hour just to buckle my boots. My hands were frozen. And Matt, what the hell is holding you up anyway? Get moving. I can't buckle my boots. I said, if somebody came in close range, you had a weapon to protect yourself. The gunner and the side, the gunner had a pistol and the rest of us had the carbines in the mortar section. Now we used to, we, we'd carry an extra uh, case of, of cartridges and we used to strap them on the stock. So you had two pouches strapped on the stock plus the one in the, in the weapon itself. You had a lot of weapons but I never used it, I never fired it, because we were firing the mortar. I never had an opportunity to, to shoot the weapon. So I think that covers what I'm supposed to talk about. Thank you. out in front of both the either a 60 millimeter or 81 and the squad leader called back and gave the yeah. number of charges the elevation and could see where things were laying. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The squad leader got the information from the section leader who got the information from the platoon uh, lieutenant because they always had the maps and I often wonder where the heck they get all these maps <laughs> and it shows oh, there's a church there there's a what church building over there? I mean, where do they get these maps from? Somebody has to get them. The forward observer would tell us maybe to shoot, drop, have one round, and then he would know where that round went, tell us how to move it, and then he might tell us two rounds or three rounds or 12 rounds. And I could put 12 rounds in as fast as somebody could put the shell shell down in, in the mortar, da, 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 right out of 12 shells, and then duck down because you're going to get stuffed back in again because you went out with all that. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mac. 
we're running a little late here, but so we I'm gonna wait. Jim's gonna come up and talk about artillery. Uh, I was wondering since we have run pretty long, if why don't we take a, a five minute break? And if you don't want to worry with that, just go on and get ready for tonight. If you want to stay and talk a little artillery, uh, stick around after five minutes. Is that okay? Hey, Jim. Because I mean, I'm well, while everybody's here, I want to ask a question of Tom or Karen. When is the next forum? All right. Tomorrow morning at 9.30. Thank you. Okay. You know, there's a series of forums, and I don't know which one it is, but uh, I want to encourage you to be here at 9.30 tomorrow. Is that with the... Uh, the the Tsar. The Tsar. The Tsar. Okay. And then uh, the one I'm particularly interested in is in the uh, the one of... Um, yeah. On the front with Willie and Joe. On the front with Willie and Joe, yes. Because we have a... A professor that's an expert on on that. So, uh, as Jim said, take a quick, or just get up and leave, and and uh, or stay in the area. So, thank you, Jim. Stretch a minute. When you when you pull the lanyard of a firing pin within the, the breech, would hit the the button on the back. And, oh, so there was a primer on the back of the case. Oh yeah, oh, just yeah. like a regular bullet. Yeah, just like a like shotgun shell okay. sort of deal. Yeah, back there on the back. And uh, similar to the mortars, there were different types of rounds. This uh, this would be high explosive. That was the most common there. And you could also, the, right there on the end was the fuse. You might want to change the fuse. If you were the same projectile, you might have a timed fuse that would uh, allow you to have a, a air burst if you had good directions on it. Most common was just the regular fuse quick that would impact upon the, on hitting the ground. Uh, how accurate were the howitzers? Yeah. It depended on how good your forward observer was. Yeah. Good. Let's let's go ahead. Here again is just a, an example of there's the, the projector being fired and being put into the breech block. Here's the, again the guy, the, the gunner that's changing elevation. The scout gears did an azimuth. He's got another round ready to go there. So basically, you got four people that you can do the job there. Three if you got desperate, I guess. Okay, now let's let me go to this. This is kind of um, Barb has always said. I, I like to know her dad was a forward observer. Okay, so here's a, an example of maybe a, a, this is an ideal situation here. Okay, you're you're you've got two companies. And this is the idea of a, of, a, of a infantry battalion. So you got first battalion here with two companies online. Second over here with two companies online. And we suppose the third battalion is in reserve. They're ready to, to do this. This is, might be more of a defensive than offensive setup there. And here's the front line across here, and you've got, you've got another battalion to the right. Now, the, in, let's say in this particular case that these two battalions are, and this is kind of similar, I guess, to what happened in, in the, the SAR. You had two battalions that made an initial attack down there, and they were side by side over there. So uh, let's say that a... Um, the, the fire direction center, this is this, this is what the headquarters company of the artillery battalion was out. They're, they're the people that tell the guns where to shoot based on the information that the forward observer has radioed back to them. Now think of, in the fire direction center, imagine this, and I've tried to draw this a little bit to scale, but, but it's not too exact. But they would have a map with pretty much the same layout on that. They know exactly from surveyed instruments where the batteries are located, where, where the position on the map these are, and where the forward observer is. They must know those two things in order to get the accuracy on this. Now, the forward observer, let's say he's got a target, uh, could be, we just use this as a tank, could be anything, could be troops there, could be somebody firing on them or anything else. The far observer has to make some estimate on what the coordinates, the map coordinates of his target are. And depending on what the terrain is like, he may be very accurate, he may not be as accurate. But, uh, but he sends back some coordinates, uh, map coordinates, to the fire direction center. They plot that. They would actually stick a pin in whatever location he says. They'd put it in their map in that location there. Back here for, the, for this battery B, They've got also a pin where battery B is located. Now, now I've 
This is the way we were learning it in the 60s, and I think it was pretty much the same way. They have this big fan that's, that's pitched down here where this, this battery is located, and they move this thing around until they get it on where the, the forward observer says the target is, okay? And from that, they, they, they'll have a reading there. That's the reading for the azimuth that they'll tell the guns that they need to set up at. And as far as the range is concerned, they know how far it is from here out to there. And then they would either use a firing table, and we're, we're not sure. I talked to one of my buddies that stayed in the service that he's not, he couldn't find whether they, they had firing tables or whether they used kind of like a slide room. Everybody remembers what a slide room was, don't you? Uh, the, the, the slide rule would have a would have a fan that you just kind of moved at. Instead of having the little the little slides, it would just be a fan that would move along the chart. And they would look at that for the range, and they could read from that what charge to use and what uh, you know how what elevation would get there with a certain charge to that particular distance. All right, and then the azimuth, the the direction left or right, they could read from just uh, you know seeing where that fan moved over there. Now, let me, let me back up to, uh, to this right here. The, the guns would be in position, they're all four of them would be uh, in, in a certain position, and there's a kind of a limitation on how far they can swing left and right. So they need to know pretty much what sector they're going to potentially be firing in the next day or on a bigger day. And they also, there's, there's a limit on the amount of elevation that, uh, that they can, can swing these things up. There, there was a method to fire what's called high angle, where this tube could be elevated up, but there's a limit. They can't do that like they do with the mortars because you've got some recoil right here. You see the back part right here? See, this is how far this thing recoils back after each round is fired. Uh, so yeah, you, you would want this thing, this, the recoil going into the ground. But anyway, you could elevate and you could, one, one possibility was to use high angle fire if you had an enemy over the back of a hill and you couldn't kind of get to them directly. And that was, you know, the different charges, different elevations would be figured into that. But that's more complicated than we want to talk about right now. So let's just go back to this. Now, uh, what, the, what the, the fire direction center then would send the information to the back. And you'd only want to make the adjustments with one gun. You want to minimize your using of your ammunition. So they'd give direction, they'd say, uh, you know, center one one piece number, one base piece, whatever your, your center one, you're probably your most active people there. Uh, one round HE charge, four elevation, so and so as and so and so. All right, and they'd fire that round in whatever direction they got. Now, as far as the far observer is concerned over here, it's difficult for him, or it's more difficult for him to know what the range is, the, like depth, depth perception, but he can know pretty well if it's on line. So what he wants to make an adjustment is to get the round where he knows it's either on this side or this side of the target. And he tries to bracket that. Now it doesn't really matter to the, to the guns in the fire direction center, even though he's going to say, let's say the first round goes right here, and we're trying to get right here, let's say it drops right there. Well, he's going to say, right so many meters to get over here, and if, he's, if he feels comfortable, comfortable that he can adjust on the range, then he might do that. But let's say he just can't tell whether that was really behind or in front of the target. So he would probably just adjust by saying, right so many <coughs> meters, and, or actually, he, he gives correction, I think, in... Uh, yeah, he does it in, in meters or yards. I'm not sure what, what you're using. The correction day. would be in degrees. Degrees or minutes. Well, but he tells me. But he, no, then he does. He, he sees how far it is, but he makes a, 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 an adjustment. He estimates what, how many yards he's going to move it in. Uh, but, he, but he does it. But looking through his binoculars and with meals, he does, he's got a factor called, I think it's the worm factor, that he can, he can very quickly adjust that to how far that is. But he, he's guessing at it, I agree. Uh, so anyway, let's say he, he, he does that accurately, he sends the information back, the next round comes out and boom, it's right there. He knows it's in front of the target, all right? Then he would add uh, maybe 400 meters to get a, a round on the other side, over here, all right? And now it's just a matter of walking those rounds in. He would then 
reduce it by 200 meters. If that was on the front side, then he knows he's got it. He goes forward 100 and, and boom. But one, once he gets within 100 or, or maybe five, maybe 50, if he's real good, on the target, then he says range correct, fire for effect. Now, what the FPC then would do, and oh, by the way, all these other guns back here have been adjusting with the same, the others. So they're, they're on the same, even though they fired around, they're adjusting just as the base piece did, or the, or the one that's doing that. And then once, once we decided that the, uh, you know, that round was close enough, then he says fire for effect, or the command's given to fire, so all four guns do. And they, uh, they, the farmer observer sees what happens, and he says repeat range for repeat fire for effect, or whatever, if it destroys the target. Uh, that's it. All right. Now that's quick and dirty how far. Now, if if uh, you know, it's really it's a lot easier if the far observer happens to be on line with the guns like this. Uh, but that's kind of one of the toughest cases maybe for a, an FO to work with. Yes, Mitch. Can I say a few words about the Cub spotter plane? Okay, you may. Okay. Uh, can I? Anybody hear me? I, I, yeah, I'm okay. Guessing. Okay. No. Uh, then, the, uh, from what I have learned, and I've written a tremendous amount about World War II, the Cub spotter planes were kind of a secret weapon nobody talks about. But the reason that American artillery was devastatingly accurate had to do with the eye in the sky, okay. the spotter planes. And the 87th Infantry Division was particularly proficient in using the spotter plane. We had a brigadier general who was in charge <coughs> of the plane. So you can imagine, in snow and sleet and all kinds of conditions, these planes could take off in farm fields and snow and spot the enemy and radio to the forward observer. And then the forward observer would in turn relay the information right. to the uh, artillery. According to the division book, the, was the first round that was fired was from the uh, artillery uh, brigadier general in a plane, I think. I yeah. believe I read that. On the forts when they were firing it there in mass in early. Yeah, I've written about the spotter plane <coughs> very, very little, uh, even on the web, and you don't find them on them. They were L4s, L5s, L60s. Oh, well, L4s, L5s. Yeah, well, L6. it is it, it, yeah. kind of depends on, uh, on whatever, what, let's go back over here, up to, uh, you know, five miles maybe. Chances are the, uh, the artillery wouldn't necessarily be that far back, but they, they could do that. They would, I mean, you don't want to get too close to the, to the action because if something happened, you had to withdraw. It takes a lot longer to get the, the artillery packed away and moved out to the other. So they, they stay a relatively safe distance back. But it could be from... So in your sketch here, you're roughly five miles. Or well, yeah, yeah, that, that, I, I should have. If I had a, some graph paper, I could have probably done that. <laughs> yeah, right. I was just wondering how yeah. the distance there. But yeah, this is, uh, this should be, yeah, let's say that's four miles behind. The target's also moving when they're adjusting. Well, <laughs> that one might have been. <laughs> but I was... That's not a very good tank, I guess. But anyway, it, it, it probably not. I mean, you probably you wouldn't shoot that that at, at a moving target. Not likely. It would be for troops, or are you you're receiving fire from area, or certainly if there were a group of you know several tanks in that area, then yeah, you'd try to get some fire on that to uh, try to knock them out. Can I just? Far? My dad, who was the border reserve, uh, he was talking about being with the company, and they were on a horse and they were and in between the shell, and he knew it was there. Somebody had spotted it. It could have been from a, a plane, or somebody else thought they were the enemy, but they weren't. But he knew they were being drafted. So Our own artillery. First, yeah, yeah, he knew it was their, his artillery. Yeah. So he's like, the first shot came in, and he knew where the next one was going, and then he knew the next one's right on. So he's on the radio. Oh. <laughs> so they, they did that bracketing. I mean, he was being bracketed, but it was like. He knew what was happening. <laughs> yeah, he knew what was going to happen. Wow. Did they do counter battery fire in World War II? I'm not sure. Uh, I would expect so. But, uh, now, when 
My, my training was in the early 60s, okay? And we were just beginning to get a computer called the FADAC. And it was as big as this thing here. You know, it was, I don't know, it was analog stuff. But, but that would basically generate the data that the fire direction center would do, rather than doing the plotting and everything. But, uh, but now, I mean, I, I, mean I, I don't know how, how automated it is now. Probably even, <coughs> even the weapons themselves, pretty self propel can probably figure all that stuff out themselves. Am I probably right? Okay, that's right. They're smart. Yes, sir. Hey, Jim, you had, you had variable powder charges. Are, is the shell standard? Is the, the deliverable standard? Or well, was that, well, that was it, if it, the HE, high explosive, was the most common, okay? But, yeah, if you change to a, 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 a timed, well, that would be the fuse, though. What if, if you were firing smoke round or maybe you also had black phosphorus, those had different weights. Now so, that HE is a brass shell with high explosive on the inside? Right, okay. right. And, and so it, they're, they're, depending on the difference in the weight, you had to use a different firing table or a different fan or a different uh, deal to, to determine what your elevation would be. And the nose with. was sensitive on impact? Is That would, would set off the charge? Right, right. The fuse, fuse quick meant that that was an impact fuse. If it were fuse time, then you also had to set a certain time on that. That was pretty complicated to, to do that. Now, I think later, I'll say later on, I, I guess they also had... Some fuses that were uh, were radar sensitive. Proximity fuses. Proximity, fuse. okay. The, the closer they'd get, it would sense how far they were from the ground. But uh, those were pretty expensive, so they, you didn't. So most 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 of these guys were probably using just high just fuse quick when they had the lane. Other questions or comments? Is that enough to get you think? You got a general idea of what the. Uh, uh, what's going on. Now, this again, that probably this setup, and, and you infantry guys know that there, there wasn't, a, except for that first battling down in Sarth, there wasn't a real lot of time that you kind of set up this way. You were, you were mostly attacking companies in columns, weren't you? I mean, you were fighting against a, trying to take a town by whatever way you could, even though there were, were sectors, I'm sure, that were split up uh, by battalions. Uh, but once uh, once you begin to break out of the bulge, it would just go from one town to the next and do whatever was necessary. And, that, and uh, so anyway, that's that's kind of an ideal <coughs> setup situation. When, okay. when you set up the guns, add the two big arms, all set, all it legs. By yeah. Mm -hmm. Are those manually just because they come together for the trailers, right? Right. Yeah. The 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 cannon those, those are. Pushed, let's go back up here to where, the, where it's marked over. There they are together. They okay? just flop yeah. together. And yeah, and, and a, a couple of guys would get on each end of those and just pull them apart. I mean, they're, they're not that heavy to do. So, and, and then you dig a little place uh, for the uh, for the base pieces to go in. Where is, where is those? That shows a little more. See, see right there? Go, there's a sandbag behind that one. Mm -hmm. So you, there, you, uh, there's going to yeah. be, even though there's recall that takes out most of the back uh, recoil there. These have to be firmly planted, both to to uh, keep your uh, the gun in the same position for the next round you're going to fire and everything. So physically, a couple of four men there could actually re aim that if they needed to. They could. Mm -hmm. you, if if uh, you had to move the whole traverse the, the whole cannon to another area, yeah, they could. Uh, they could. It might be a little difficult getting it out of there. It might have to use a shovel a little bit to dig up there. But uh, yeah, they can lift up the ends of those. See, it's kind of balanced. You got some weight up here to the front, uh, so they can lift up the end of the. Uh, um, hey, Jim, roughly, what would that unit weigh? The whole unit weigh? Yeah. I don't know. A lot. I, I know <laughs> we transported those in the back of those C-130s we had this morning in Vietnam. Uh, they, but I can remember how many were in. Well, how they, one or two would go in one. Must not be too two. terribly heavy though, because I mean it's two tires. I mean, Few thousand. Yeah, yeah. I'd be surprised if it was a ton. Yeah, tons. Tons. Yeah, ton. Right here. Mm -hmm. Oh, right in between the two. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right there. Yeah, that's the canister where he's fired one and it just fell out. Mm -hmm. All he does after the firing, the, uh, the, um, the the gun recalls and then he opens the breech and automatically the that canister pops out and the cow runs in another. 
Tanks were the same, similar way. You just wrap up on a tank and reach those points. Like, you may have covered it before, I in, but generally every infantry division had artillery attached as oh, part of the division. Division it artillery. It was division artillery. Right. It wasn't only attached, it was a part a of the part division. Of it, yeah, not attached, but yeah. There, yeah. there might be times on a certain attack that additional units from Corps or whatever could be attached to that division. But then you'd get up in the much larger, the 190s, the, and okay. so on, 210s. And, and the division also had a cannon company that, it's not totally clear to me how that was used. I'm sure that was under, or I guess that could be sent to any one of the three battalions that were part of division artillery, but uh, there was a, a cannon company that's uh, this. Other thoughts or comments? Uh, 9.30 is the, we're going to talk about the SAR tomorrow. And uh, again, come down and uh, uh, that's a, that was a, a really a, a tough time. Probably, I guess, the, per day, the, uh, the division lost more men during that time than any other. It was not, it was a, uh, considering both medical type things and others there. So it was a, uh, a tough beginning, but the, the one I guess that had to be done. So we're going to talk a little about that and actually try to get some spot interviews from you people that took part in that. And that's scheduled for an hour and a half, and then at 11.15 an hour, uh, report from Plowin, and then in the afternoon from uh, from 2 to 3 is the upfront uh, with Willie and Joe, uh, with Professor Pestino, right? right. right. Okay, good. Thanks for sticking around. Enjoy.